God is the God of fresh starts and new beginnings and second chances. God is the God of glory days. Welcome to Glory Days, a series of messages on the life and the book of Joshua. God gave Joshua and the children of Israel a second shot at the promised land, and they snatched it up. If you're in need of a second shot, a fresh start, then Joshua's book is for you. Our Glory Days declaration is about to appear on the screen. I invite you to fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. I want you to say it like you mean it. You ready? These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. And God's promises are true. And His Word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all He wants me to be and do all He wants me to do and receive all He wants me to receive. These days are glory days. And may they be so, Lord. May they be so. May you have mercy, please, upon the one who speaks, for his sins are many. And grant that we might receive a fresh word from your throne, from your teaching. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said. The last words I remember hearing before I descended into the water were, you're going to regret it. I waved away the warning without turning around. What was to regret? Everyone else was taking the long way. I was taking the shortcut. Let the others walk around the water. I just wade right through it. After all, it was just the Everglades. <laughs> of course, I'd never been in the Everglades. I'd never seen a Florida swamp. I'd seen creeks in Texas and lakes in New Mexico. Why, I even had been trout fishing in Colorado. Water is water, right? Wrong, wrong, wrong. My newfound Florida friends tried to tell me. They were taking me to a picnic, a welcome to Miami party. The tables sat on the other side of the swamp, and the park department had kindly constructed a bridge over which pedestrians could pass. But who needed a bridge? I was fresh out of college. I was single. I had a swagger. I was eager to impress. And I was undaunted at the sight of a few yards of marshland. Ah, I'll just wade across, I told them. Someone pointed at the sign. I read the sign. The sign said, swamp water not recommended for recreation. Ah, I couldn't be slowed by a warning. So I ventured in. The mud swallowed my feet. The brine was murky, smelly, and a home to a million mosquitoes. Squiggly things began to swim past me. Scaly things brushed against me. I think I saw a set of eyeballs <laughs> peering in my direction, so I backpedaled. Both flip-flops were sucked into the abyss, <laughs> never to be seen again. I exited mud-covered, mosquito-bitten, much embarrassed. I walked over the bridge and took my seat at the picnic table. Everyone else at the party was happy. <laughs> but I was muddy, embarrassed, itchy, and wet. Everyone else enjoyed the picnic. I pretended to, but how could I sit in there in dry mud and mosquito welts and regrets? It made for a miserable picnic. It also makes for an apt reminder. Life comes with voices, and voices lead to choices, and choices have consequences. 
little context. You'll remember we're studying through the book of Joshua, and we're looking at seven years in the history of Joshua in which they were an unbridled, unprecedented success. Forty years in the wilderness followed by seven years in the promised land in which they inherited what God had promised to them. And we're wondering as Christians what we can learn from this time of success, this campaign of triumph. How can we leave behind our wilderness and step into our promised land? The truth of the matter is many Christians grumble at the picnic. Why do some saints thrive while others scramble to survive? Why do some Christians tackle Everest-sized challenges while, and succeed while others walk seemingly downhill paths and just stumble? Why are some people unquenchably content while others are inexplicably and seemingly eternally unhappy? I've wondered this in my own life. Some seasons I sense the wind at my back. My sail is full billowed. Other seasons I'm pedaling a flat tired unicycle up Pikes Peak. Why? At least part of the answer has to do with swamps and signs and chosen paths. You see, glory days happen when we make good choices. Trouble happens when we don't. This is the headline message delivered by Joshua in the nationwide assembly in the Valley of Shechem. If you like to fill in blanks and take notes, there's a cue. As you compile your list of geographical touchstones in the book of Joshua, don't overlook the valley of Shechem. The list would include the Jordan River. That's where the site of the crossing. The Gilgal encampment. We've visited Gilgal. That's where the stones of remembrance were stacked. That's where the renewal of circumcision appeared. That's that's where Joshua enjoyed the experience the appearance of the commander of the Lord's army. Jericho, where the walls fell. The village of Ai, A-I, where Achan fell, where Joshua rebounded. And now the valley of Shechem. It's interesting that the pilgrimage to Shechem from Gilgal was the idea of Moses. He had instructed Joshua to bring the invasion to a halt and every person to a valley for what must have been the most extraordinary sight ever documented between those two mountains. Reading from the book of Deuteronomy, Moses said to Joshua, when you cross the Jordan, set up these stones at Mount Ebal and coat them with plaster as I am commanding you today. Then build an altar there to the Lord your God using natural uncut stones. Use it to offer burnt offerings to the Lord your God. Also sacrifice peace offerings on it and celebrate by feasting there before the Lord your God. You must clearly write all these instructions on the stones coated with plaster. Shechem was a 25-mile hike from the Hebrew encampment of Gilgal. Remember, two million people are a part of this campaign. Two million people. The city of San Diego. The people must have looked like an Amazon river of humanity as they marched from Gilgal to Shechem. And once they reached the valley, Joshua set about the task of obeying Moses, of building an altar. Now we're in Joshua chapter 8. Now Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. 
And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there, in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. In the ancient East, it was customary for kings to commemorate their military achievements by recording their conquests on huge stones covered with plaster. Joshua, however, didn't memorialize his work. He celebrated God's word. He celebrated God's law. As if to say the secret to their success was not the strength of their army, but the resolve of his people to keep God's commandments. And now, the best part. Then all Israel, with their elders and officers and judges, stood on either side of the ark before the priests the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before, that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law the blessings and the cursings according to all that is written in the book of the law. The meadows of Shechem sit between two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim. To this day, it's a beautiful valley, gardens and orchards and olive groves grow throughout the lap of the valley. Limestone stratum sits in the deepest part of the crevice, and it's broken into ledges so that it appears to be the presence of natural benches that can seat large crowds of people. The rock formation creates an acoustic property that allows voices that originate on one mountain to be heard all the way over on the other mountain. And so Joshua assigned the tribes to stand on the two mountains, six on one side, six on the other, six on Gerizim, and six on Ebal where the altar had been built. And in the valley between stood the priests, the Levites, the leaders, the Ark of the Covenant, and Joshua himself. And when Joshua and the Levites began reading the blessings, they stood on Mount Gerizim. And the blessings were shouted from Mount Gerizim over the valley to the Mount of Ebal. And every time the blessing would be read from Mount Gerizim, the people standing on Mount Ebal would respond and say, Amen. Are you imagining this? Two million people? Something like this. If you listen obediently to the voice of God, He will defeat your enemies. Amen. He will order a blessing on your barns. Amen. Lavish you with good things. Amen. Throw open the doors of his sky vaults and pour rain on your land. Amen. Amen. All of these are listed in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The same procedure was followed in the proclamation of the curses. Cursed is anyone who carves a God image came the declaration from Mount Ebal, this time toward the people on Mount Gerizim. Amen, the people of Gerizim said. Who demeans a parent. Amen. Who takes a bribe to kill an innocent person. Amen. Back and forth, back and forth, voices reverberated off the stone cliffs. All the people, the children, the immigrants, the old-timers, the new-timers, everyone in antiphonal rhythm proclaimed their values. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. Keep in mind the when and the where of this assembly. When did it happen? In the middle of an invasion. Where were they? Smack dab in the middle of enemy territory. 
These desert toughened soldiers pressed the pause button on the physical battle so they could fight the spiritual battle. Heeding God's word is more important than fighting God's war. Or, better said, heeding God's word is fighting God's war. Conquest happens as the covenant is honored. Do you want some glory days? Do you want a season of uninterrupted victory? Do you want to inherit your Canaan? Do you want to move from conquest to conquest? Do you want to come out of your wilderness and step forward into the inheritance that God has prepared for you? Here's what Shechem teaches us. Obey God's commands. What's that? You wanted something a little more elaborate? A little more mystical? Exotic? Intriguing? You thought Canaan-level life was born out of ecstatic utterances or angelic visions or mountaintop moments or midnight messages from heaven? Sorry to disappoint you. Obedience, wrote C.S. Lewis, is the key to all doors. The promised land life is enjoyed by those who take the bridge over the swamp. Period. Don't think for a second that you can heed the wrong voice and make the wrong choice and escape the consequences. At the same time, obedience leads to a waterfall of goodness. Not just for you, but for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and the children of a thousand generations in the future. God shows love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commandments. As we align ourselves with God's plan, we open the door for God's favor. This is no promise or guarantee of an easy life. The good man does not escape all his troubles. Scripture says he has them too. But the Lord helps him in each and every one. Case in point, the remarkable change of Pitcairn Island History buffs will remember the story of how in the spring of 1789, a band of mutinous sailors sailed to this tiny dot of an island in the South Pacific. Goaded on by the cruelty of Captain Bly, they gave him and his followers the boot and a boat, and they watched them disappear and float out to sea. Captain Bly remember, made it safely back to England where he testified against his crew that had helped him sail the ship called the Bounty. Mutiny on the Bounty. Do you know what ever happened to those sailors who committed mutiny on the Bounty? They settled on Pitcairn Island. They took Tahitian wives. They recruited Tahitian workers. The island had the makings of a tropical paradise, but the men turned it into a living hell. They elevated no standard, no morals, no laws. They created a sinkhole of violence, adultery, drunkenness. Within a decade, they were dead from disease, attacks, and infighting. Only one mutineer survived, a man by the name of Alexander Smith. Left alone on a two-square-mile island surrounded by natives and half-bred children, you know what he began to do? 
He found a Bible and began to read it, study it, and obey it. He convinced the islanders to do the same. And when the British Navy discovered the Pitcairn Island in 1808, they were stunned by the order and the decency. In fact, Pitcairn became the byword, a dictionary word for order and decency in the 19th century. Obedience leads to blessing. Obedience leads to blessing. Disobedience leads to trouble. Remember the parable of Jesus? He talked about two builders, each who built a house. One built on cheap, easy to use, easy to buy, easy to access sandy land. The other built on rock. It was more expensive. It was harder to reach. His construction project demanded more time and expense. But when the spring rains turned the creek into a gully washer, guess which builder enjoyed a blessing and which one experienced trouble? Beachfront property doesn't make for much if it can't withstand the storm. The wise builder... Jesus said, is whoever hears these sayings of mind and what? And does them. Please note, both builders in the story hear the sayings. Both hear the sayings. The difference between the two is not knowledge and ignorance, but obedience and disobedience. It's not enough to hear the precepts. Security comes as we put them into practice. We are only as strong as our obedience. That's why James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. A few months back, I was on a ministry trip to New York City. I had spent the day in the company of co-workers, colleagues, and friends. The final engagement of the evening concluded around 10 p.m. As we entered the hotel lobby, I realized that I was hungry. My colleagues weren't. They had eaten during the banquet at which I had spoken. I realized I hadn't eaten. They were tired, but I was hungry. I considered going to the room and ordering room service, but the lobby was packed, and I thought, oh, that will take forever. I remembered a delicatessen just outside the hotel, two blocks down the street. So I told my friends good night. I walked out the door, and I headed down the street. Within a few minutes, I was on my way back, sandwich in hand. As I crossed the street toward my hotel, two women were standing on the street corner next to my hotel. One of them spoke to me. Excuse me, sir, she said. I stopped. I turned. I remember noticing they were dressed nicely. I assumed they had come out of the theater. Yes, I said. And one of them looked at me and said, could you use some company tonight? I was taken aback. Young women don't flirt with me. I mean, look at me. I'm nearly 60 years old. My hair is falling out. I fight the battle of the belly bulge. I haven't popped a bicep since Clinton was in office. (laughs) Then it dawned on me. They weren't interested in me. They were interested in what I might pay them. I realized I was on two intersections. An intersection in New York City. 
but also the intersection of morality, voices, choices, consequences. This verse popped into my thoughts as I stood there. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. I turned like a scalded dog. I said no, and I walked as fast as I could to my hotel room. I took the first available elevator, and I went before I even sat down, and I called Dean Lynn. Imagine if I hadn't. Imagine the pain. Imagine the guilt. The potential embarrassment for our church. For my family. The shame. Talk about a swampland, huh? There's some voices that are going to be talking to you in the next few days. And you're going to find yourself at an intersection. These voices are waiting for you at school, at work, in your neighborhood, on the internet. Don't you think for a second that they're going to be quiet? Satan does not like seeing you press into your promised land. And he knows he cannot take your salvation, but he is hell-bound on taking your joy, your fruitfulness, your credibility, and your fruit. And he will do whatever he can to dismantle your faith. You need to decide right now what you will say when you hear that voice. Right now. Many Christians miss out on the promised land life simply because of disobedience. They just disobey. They buy into the lie that says, well, I can disobey and there will be no consequences. I do believe God always removes the guilt, but I also believe that He often leads us with the consequences. And I don't want you to live with those consequences. You can decide right now. You can pray, Lord, you go ahead of me. You fill my mind with truth. You fill my heart with conviction. And when those voices speak, may I heed your voice and make the right choice and enjoy the consequence of blessing. Remember whose you are. Listen, remember whose you are. You are a child of God. You have been bought with the most precious commodity in the history of the universe, the blood of Jesus Christ. And you are indwelled by the power of God Himself, the Holy Spirit. And you have been set apart for a high and holy work. And He is equipping you and developing you for the kingdom that is to come in which you will serve with Him forever. You are a holy child of God. Remember whose you are. And remember where you are. This is promised land you're in. Satan has no jurisdiction over you. And you resist him and he must flee. He must. This promise comes to you from 1 Corinthians 10. God is faithful. And he will keep temptation from becoming so strong that you cannot stand up against it. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you will not give in to it. Choose obedience. I suggest a reenactment of Shechem. Wouldn't that be something? If we could find a field, a valley, a canyon large enough to hold several million people, and we all made a pilgrimage there, and we walked away from our campaigns and our conquests, 
and we reaffirmed our convictions and we stood on one side and declared our yes and just stood on the other side and we said amen, the blessings and the curses, the promises and the consequences. But then again, we don't have to wait for a national assembly, do we? We can stage our own personal renewals and we can ask this important question, whose voice will I hear this week? Whose voice will hold sway over my life? One final thought before we move out of this chapter in the book of Joshua. Take note, please, of the altar's location. The stone altar that was made with unhewn stone, where was it built? Was it built on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing? No. Joshua built it on Mount Ebal, the hill of the cursings, as if to remind us, even in the midst of poor choices, there is a sacrifice. There is grace. May we hear the right choice. May we make the right choice. May we enjoy blessing upon blessing. But if we don't, and sometimes we don't, May we return to the altar on Ebal and receive the sacrifice offered by Christ. It was made for people like us. Amen. And so, Lord, we pray now that you would take your word. Help us to be doers and not just hearers. Thank you that you have already reminded us going into this week that we will hear voices that are not from you and we'll have a chance to make choices Help us to make the right choice, Father, and to enjoy your consequences, your blessings. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.